everybody for joining us today. Uh, the title of today's webinar is Patient Engagement, Improving Quality and Care Within the Safety Net Community. Before we begin, we wanted to introduce our organization. Great Basin Primary Care Association is a nonprofit membership organization. Our members include community health centers, tribal clinics, and other safety net providers. GBPCA provides training and technical assistance, policy analysis, and best practice information to safety net providers in the state. We do this via webinars, like the one you're attending today, face-to-face -face meetings, and at association events. To learn more and to become a member, please visit our website. There are three housekeeping items to review before we begin the presentation. Number one, this is a live presentation that we will be archiving on our website. Please do not put this call on hold as the presentation might be interrupted by on hold music. Number two, please ask questions. Our presenter, Dr. Halupa, encourages you to ask questions at any point before, during, or after the presentation. And number three, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website within the coming days. About our presenter, Dr. Colleen Halupa has been a professor in the Doctorate of Health Education program at ATSU's School of Health Management since 2006. She has an AS in Medical Laboratory Technology, a BS in Healthcare Management, an MS in Health Administration, and an EDD in Curriculum and Instruction with a concentration in Educational Leadership and Management. Prior to her career in academia, Dr. Halupa joined the United States Air Force as a medical laboratory technician. Thereafter, she became a laboratory manager and consultant at a hospital in rural Nebraska. Dr. Halupa rejoined the Air Force as a biomedical sciences officer. During her tenure, she held varying positions in health administration and education culminating as an assistant administrator at a large health facility. Dr. Halupa is an active contributor to professional journals and has spoken at several state, national, and international health and education conferences. She writes and presents on rural health care issues and the new Health Reform Act. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Halupa to the presentation. Thank you very much, Scott. I'm just going to pull my slides up. And today we're going to talk about patient engagement. I'm just going to give you a little overview of what we're going to discuss first. We're going to talk about patient engagement. What actually is it? The benefits and challenges of patient engagement. Patient engagement and its relationship to patient satisfaction. Ideas about patient engagement measuring patient engagement and quality, strategies for patient engagement, how to measure it and some tools that you can use, challenges and new roles, technology, and marketing. So we have kind of a full agenda to talk about today. Please stop me at any time if you uh, have a question about something as I'm speaking about it. The first thing we're going to talk about is defining patient engagement. And there's lots of definitions out there as to what it actually is. Uh, the Get Well Network says it's a national health priority and a core strategy. Leonard Kish says it's the blockbuster drug of the century. Steve Wilkins says it's the holy grail of health care. And Rob Lambert, who's a physician that blogs quite a bit online, says it's not a strategy, it's what care should be. <clears throat> so basically, there's a lot of definitions for what patient engagement is, but if you break it down, it's a process physician and all members of the practice that are help facilitating that engagement. Why is patient engagement so important now? Well, the reason is that the assumptions are that when engagement develops naturally when there's regular focused communication, 
it leads to behavior with which this most closely approach treatment guidelines. So patients will follow what they're told to do is what the theory is. And engaged patients make fewer demands on health systems, and overall the goal is improved health. So it's advocated in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which actually created the Pen Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, and this provides data for patient and clinical decisions. The whole purpose of this is to promote clinical effectiveness research that assists patients, providers, and policymakers in making informed decisions concerning the way disease can be prevented, diagnosed, and treated through research. And eventually this data is going to be available to patients and providers. Another reason for patient engagement why now is it's one of the Institute of Medicine's six domains of quality, which is patient-centered care. The National Committee for Quality Assurance Physician Practices Connections recognition requires practices to implement a survey of patients' experience of care in order to be part of their organization. They actually use a tool which is called CAPS, which is the approved patient satisfaction tool for the National Committee of Quality Assurance. And they're encouraging practices to use this and then report on their application survey to obtain recognition as a patient-centered medical home. However, many federally qualified health centers don't choose to use this because it's cost prohibitive. But that's one of the reasons that's driving patient engagement. Another reason is the American Board of Medical Specialties has endorsed, including the core CAPS communication items, in this revision of maintenance of certification requirements for all 24 of its member boards. So they have deemed that this is important as well. One thing that is of note that I was not able to find if it actually had been renewed, but CAP's contract actually expired in July 2012, and new data is pending. So that's kind of in flux right now, and I could not find anything that said when it's actually coming back, but the standards that they used are still out there. So other medical boards and state licensing agencies could reinforce these expectations by adopting similar provisions, and in some states it's already occurred. California, Massachusetts, Minnesota, they all publicly report patient experience data for a portion of their primary care practices, as do other areas of Denver, Kansas City, and Memphis. Now this can be challenging because when you report, you could report either good or bad, and that's something to be considered. And if you do report and you have transparency, you would have to report both. The next driver is the High Tech Act, or the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act. And this was part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. And it has incentives for adopting electronic health records. With this act and the monies to accelerate the adoption of health records also comes potential penalties. And these penalties for willful neglect can expend up to 250000 up to $1.5 million. So basically, this legislature has good and bad points. There's monies to actually increase electronic medical records, but if you do not do it correctly, you could get yourself in trouble. So also, this act deals a lot with HIPAA provisions and the requirements for HIPAA to be met in the online format. One thing that's suggested with this High Tech Act is that if you have agreements with other businesses, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, you have to make sure that there's agreements in place and that these agreements are sound in their terminology to meet all of the requirements. Excuse me, Dr. Halupa, this is Patrick. I have a question. Yes. How much would it cost for a practice or, or a hospital to convert to, to your electronic records? Oh, that can vary quite a bit. Um, it depends on the size of the practice and the electronic medical record that they decide to adopt, but it's very, very, very costly. Um, I'm sorry I can't give you anything more specific than that because there's so many factors that deal with it, but it's a huge investment for a practice. Um, a very, very major investment, as it is for a hospital. Is it chance to increase uh, the quality of care 
in, in conjunction with patient engagement? Um, yes, the purpose for electronic medical records, the theory is that if electronic records are available throughout the care continuum, that anybody who needs information on a patient and has the right to review it would actually be able to see that information. So if I walked into the emergency room in Denver, but I lived in Texas, they would be able to bring up my history somehow. The problem with this comes is there's hackers out there that have hacked into medical systems. Personally, I, I have TRICARE, and my TRICARE records have been uh, hacked through the military about four or five times. So all my personal medical information has been uh, out there for consumption of those other than should have it. So that's a scary part of this of this whole transformation is that it has to be done correct. The intent is for quality, but just like anything that's mandated sometimes, when a mandate is made, it sounds really wonderful in theory, but actually to actually do it is much more difficult, I think, than the policymakers realized in the beginning as far as actually the implementation of it and what has to be done at the practice level, at the hospital level. I don't know if that answers your question good enough, but... Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then last but not least, uh, patient engagement is driven by research and best practices. There's some research out there that I will talk about in a little bit about how this actually increases patient outcomes. Well, let's look at patient engagement. And if you look at it the way it sits right now, the statistics are very, very bleak. It's a very significant struggle for most institutions. About 90% of adult Americans struggle trying to even interpret everyday health information. And fewer than 50% of adults with high cholesterol, depression, or asthma actually follow their care instructions. So how do you take somebody who does not comply, get them engaged in their care to have a positive outcome? Sometimes easier said than done because as money becomes associated with this, it becomes more and more important. The other factor in this is loyalty in the outpatient setting is very low. Only about 92% of adults rate care continu continuing is very important. And only about 18% will be willing to spend an additional $20 to $40 a month to maintain the same primary care provider. I look at myself when I was in the military, and I can tell you I would have definitely paid to have the same primary care provider because when I went to the primary care provider, I had a different one every single time that I went, which was kind of difficult because you start over. Some patients may go from provider to provider for various reasons because their provider doesn't do what they think they should do for them, because they're embarrassed, because they're not complying. There's lots of different reasons why people provider jump. And engagement is particularly low amongst two emerging populations. Senior citizens, only about 3% have proficient health literacy levels. And the projected insurance enrollees who are supposed to come on board in 2014 under the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, only about 29% of them had uh, interaction with our system, our medical system, in the past year. So they really don't know how to interpret health information either. So there's a lot of work to be done in this arena. Some of the benefits of patient engagement. One study done by Bertakis and Azari found it decreases utilization of healthcare services. They had 509 patients. They had a 20 question questionnaire. They controlled for patient sex, age, education, income, self-reported health status, and risk behavior such as obesity, alcohol abuse, and smoking. And they looked at these people at a patient-centered care clinic during a one-year period. And what they found is it actually decreased the actual number of visits for specialty care. These patients had less frequent hospitalizations and fewer laboratory and diagnostic tests. Total medical charges for the year were significantly reduced, as were charges for specialty care. This was more effective in females than it was in males. Now, this is a very small study that used the instrument they used was the Davis Observation Code. So this is not necessarily indicative of all populations at all, but it is something that shows that there has been some efficacy with some populations 
with patient engagement techniques. Also, they found lower malpractice rates with a positive patient experience. If your patients are happy with what you do, they're less likely to sue you. Another study by Coulter and Elkins looked at patients, and they found that patient engagement techniques increased patient recall and confidence. They had more knowledge to actually manage their conditions, and along with that knowledge, the confidence was even more important. Also, it was increased the likelihood that patients were reporting that they felt like they had chosen the treatment path that was appropriate to them because they had skin in the game, if you want to call it that. They actually had buy-in on what they were doing. Satisfaction was increased, adherence was increased, and there was increased monitoring and prevention of disease in this particular population. Again, a small study, but again can be representative of the effectiveness that it can have. The next thing I wanted to talk about briefly was the domains of patient engagement. Although patient engagement is something that's newer in the United States at this point, it's more or less old hat in Great Britain. So Great Britain has done a lot of the research on patient engagement. If you look at the size of Great Britain and the population they serve and the population of the United States, they're very small compared to the United States. If you look at Great Britain initially, they had socialized medicine and it wasn't really working altogether, so they actually allow their <clears throat> citizens to buy private insurance now as well. But they did use patient engagement as a way to try to cut costs. And the domains that they feel are important are agreement and understanding of the patient responsibilities. In this thought, patients are, not, are now responsible. The provider is not responsible to make the patients quote unquote better. The patient's responsible to make themselves better. Assessing and expressing needs and wants regarding patient engagement. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this later. Some patients aren't confident enough to express what they want. Some patients don't want engagement. Uh, you'll find that particularly in senior citizen populations, and we'll talk about that later. But as practices try to deal with this concept of patient engagement, it needs to be realized that there are both ends of the spectrum. Patients have to have confidence that the engagement is real, that it's timely, that it's sincere. And the consultation length, providers need to be available in a sufficient time to actually facilitate engagement with some patients that may take longer than others and patients judge their satisfaction with their experience by this length and by their own personal perceptions of what's adequate. The next domain is understanding the impact of contextual factors on consultation. And what this means is uh, there needs to be a positive bent on this. The patient needs to understand that if they help manage their own care, that they're going to feel better, they're going to be better. And physicians need to key in on the factors that most likely will help a patient reach that point. The next domain is training and support for engaging. You need to maybe perhaps train your providers, and most likely will. But not only do you have to train your providers, you actually have to train your patients. As you use some of these engagement techniques, such as technology, for instance, if you're going to have a patient portal where they can access some of their medical information, you're going to have to provide training for the patients to use that because still even at this time, a lot of our patients are not computer savvy and won't be able to do that on their own. Um, informational support is the next domain. The patients have to have access to the appropriate information in the right format. So what this means is a format written for a layperson so they can actually understand what their treatment options are, what their disease process is, whatever that hap happens to be. Respect is the next domain. Patients want to feel that the providers respect them. Also, providers want to feel that patients respect their experience and want to engage in their, in their care. So respect goes both ways in order for this to work. And the last domain is continuity of care. In order for this to work, the patient has to ensure continuity of care, and the physician has to ensure continuity of care as well. 
And as I said, this is all research from the King's Fund in Great Britain. Dr. Halupa, it's, it's Scott. Uh, I just had a quick question. As you're talking about patient engagement and you were talking about the notion of systems in place, what are suggestions that you have for talking to patients about the topic of uh, HIPAA and that if they give information and it's electronic, it's going to be safe? Well, th that's um, basically if you're going to give patients information about HIPAA and you want to prove to them that it's going to be safe, first off, that information has to be written in a format that the patient can understand. For example, we as medical people are going to say something like, we will not violate HIPAA in regards to your private health information. Well, maybe that makes very much sense to us. But if you have a patient who's 80 years old, what you need to tell them perhaps instead is that you're going to have some of your medical information online if you choose to access it. This medical information is going to be safe. We've ensured it by making sure there's a lot of uh, factors in there that will ensure that it's safe, and nobody will be able to get at your information. The explanation has to be very different. And now you might deal with another healthcare person that would would not want that simplistic uh, explanation. So it really depends on the patient literacy quite a great deal, which makes it very problematic because then what you end up with is perhaps one or two documents for patients depending on their health literacy. And I'm not going to say that that's the best, but that may be something that needs to be done. Going back to that, if you're going to know what your patient's health literacy is, that means you're probably going to have to assess it. So basically, when getting into the format of patient engagement, you're really expanding into marketing, data mining, assessment of patient wants, needs. It gets much more complicated, I think, than it ever was before. No longer the patient walks in the door, we treat them, and they go away. When they go away, we need to keep engaging them over and over and over again in whatever method works. For patients that don't use technology, that may be the telephone. Um, so everything old is new again, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but you're, there's going to be some movement forward in technology and some movement backward. Okay, I don't know if that answered your question good enough. Is that okay? Yeah, no, it did. Thank you very much. All right, patient status. I'm sorry, did somebody else have a question? Hi, this is Patrick. Uh, Going back to the domain, um, the, the training domain, and mm -hmm. with ACA and all these new uh, communities expected to sign up for for healthcare and hopefully getting to to see a doctor for the first time, mm -hmm. what would you suggest or recommend as like a forum to to have these trainings for for engagement for both the, the provider side and the patient side, like? Like, how would you recommend institutionalizing or formalizing a system for that training to happen? Basically, the, the first thing that the organization would have to create is an actual training plan. They would have to look at um, the, the provider piece is fairly easy. Provider training is going to happen most likely when it best meets the provider's needs. I don't know if that would be over lunchtime, depending on the clinic. It may be something that some different clinics might put it online for their providers. It really depends on the situation in the clinic itself. When you get into training your patients, it gets much more difficult because of what I talked about before, the different health literacies that the patients have. Also, how do you get them in to train and how do you get them uh, to come in and how do you meet the needs of them when they're available. For example, if it's a working population, you're going to have to do your trainings overnight. I mean, excuse me, in the evening. There might be some populations you need to do it overnight. Who knows? It depends on who you serve. The other issue you have to deal with is multiculturalism, um, your different patient demographics. That is all going to play into your training. So in your training plan, you're really going to have to look at who your practice is going to serve how you best are going to meet those demographics. For example, if you're in an area where there's a very active community center, let's say in the, um, let's say you're in a Hasidic Jewish community, 
and there's a, a very active community center for those Hasidic Jews, and they are part of your population, and you want to access them. You might go into the center and ask to do some training there. A lot of it's going to be the practices going where the patients want them. It becomes a game of if you want the patients, then you have to be there when the patients want you to be there at their behest, because otherwise they're not going to participate in the training. Is that a good enough answer to your question? Yeah, thank you. OK. The next thing I'm going to talk about is patient satisfaction. What do patients want? And it's very, very simple, really. They want somebody to listen to them. Most of them want to be involved in their decisions. They want information and explanations. The explanations that they want need to be to their level. So basically, when you talk about listening, they want you to hear their full story. And their full story may be long and involved, and it may take five or 10 minutes to get to the actual point. But if that's how the patient communicates, that's how they want you to deal with them, which is very difficult when we have limited physicians, we have limited appointments, we have limited time. How do you meet the engagement of that 85-year-old woman who lives alone, who doesn't have anybody to talk to, who when she comes to the doctor wants to talk a whole lot but really doesn't tell you what's wrong with her? That's going to be a big challenge with this. With involvement in the decisions, Patients want to be involved to the extent that they want to be. They want enough time to decide. They don't want to make an immediate decision. They want to know the pros and cons. And they want the ability to go back and revisit the decision. So basically what that means is the patient comes into the primary care provider and they talk about a surgery, for example, that's not required but it's elective. The patient wants the ability to go away and then re-engage with that provider in another day or two to rediscuss it again and then make the final decision, which unfortunately with our limitations, that's not something that's going to be easily met. The last thing is patients want to know that they have the final choice. And this is mostly the younger patients that require this. A lot of the older patients don't want to make a choice. They want the physician to make the choice for them. In regards to information and explanation, they want the opportunities to ask about their condition. They want the information in the format that's preferred for them. So if I'm an elderly patient, I might want a large print pamphlet. If I'm a young patient, I may want it online where I can access it on my mobile phone or on my computer or when I, because that's the way I communicate and you have everything else in between. So this becomes really, really challenging. And also, the patient wants to have confidence in the provider's knowledge. They don't want to feel that the provider doesn't really quite know what to do for them. Unfortunately, there are times when the provider is not quite sure what some, when something is wrong with somebody, and they don't know definitively. And patients don't always understand this. For consultation length, they want enough time they don't want to feel rushed, but yet they don't want to feel like they're wasting the provider's time either, at least most of them. Some of them just want somebody to talk to, as I talked about earlier. And then empathy is an important factor. They want to feel that the provider is interested in them as a person. I see a rheumatologist, for example, and my rheumatologist books four people every 15 minutes, and I know that he does because he's very, very busy. And sometimes when I go to see him, it's very, very rushed. You know, how are you now? And, and I'm out the door. Other times, it's not. Um, but one thing I can say about him is every time he walks in the door, he remembers things about me. He remembers that I was in the military. He remembers all different kinds of things about me and what I do now. Now, that can be just a matter of the provider even writing that on the chart, but that's important to patients because it recognizes them as a person. Patients want to be taken seriously and treated with dignity and respect. They want the provider to show care and compassion, and the provider must be willing to look at it through a patient's eyes. Last but not least, if they're very, very sick, they want fast service in an emergency. Now, let's link this back 
this is for the gener general patient. We know that there are patients that are drug seekers or patients that want treatment that's not indicated. And this all plays into that as well, because those, those patients are going to be giving you ratings just as your patients are who really aren't that way. So that's just something to consider, because that is going to bias some of your results. So what's needed for effective patient engagement to exist? It's multifactorial. It takes both the provider and the patient. They both have to be committed to building a relationship. If a provider has a caring attitude, that really helps with this. Both have to develop specific competencies to be effective. The provider may have to gain some additional communication skills for dealing with demog different demographic populations. The patients may have to gain some health knowledge that they never had before in order for this to work. So both the provider and the patient are put in a place where they have confidence, they don't have a lot of confidence about how this is going to work because they're feeling their way. And that's exactly the point that we are now as this starts to develop is practices will be feeling their way to see what works best for them. And again, the perceived power of the provider may make older patients not comfortable in engaging in their care, so that can be a barrier. Time is a huge barrier, and resources is a huge barrier. Some patients come in having expectations that they're going to walk out the door with five different kind of pills, and they're going to all feel better. Well, if they don't need those five different pills, they're not going to get them. So again, you go back to lack of satisfaction. Patients at times think that they need to use resources that they don't need that they don't <clears throat> use need to use. For example, if a patient comes in with a headache, an MRI is probably not going to be the first place that the physician goes to deal with chronic headaches. There's going to be other processes first, but those patients may want that MRI right off the bat and be dissatisfied if they don't get it. So let's talk about some ideas for patient engagement. This is actually how to increase patient engagement some things that have been out there that have been tried. And the most common practice is patient participation groups. And they're found about in about 40% of the practices in the UK. And as like I, I said earlier, the UK is a little further ahead on this than we are. And it works as long as the patients don't become too critical. They do function in a subservient role to the practice. They're just there to funnel up issues to the practice. This can be very formal or informal, but the purpose of this is to help the practice connect to the community at large. There should be a mix of patients of age, gender, ethnicity, whatever your practice demographic is, that should be the makeup of your PPG. They're not designed to be doctor's fan clubs. They're not designed uh, for a complaint mechanism. There's other mechanisms for complaints. But what it, this does is it actually helps patients understand some of the practice limitations due to reimbursement and other issues. These are things that patients as a whole may not know and may not understand. And once they understand them, they'll feel better about them. The problem is trying to get that understanding out to the community as a whole. The PPGs can be tasked to do this, <coughs> but that may or may not be effective. One other problem with PPGs is a lot of people want to join it for social status. They want to join it to say, I'm on that large medical practices patient board or patient participation group because they make, it makes them feel important, not because they're doing it because they want to help the community as large. Also, people will join it as a source of fundraising as well. And those are things that really, really need to be avoided. Dr. Halupa, it's Scott. In regards to PPGs, mm -hmm. do you feel like there are HIPAA concerns that need to be discussed before you enter into group discussions? Um, I think definitely. I think anytime you talk anything medical to anybody, you need to go over HIPAA and what HIPAA is. In the context of these PPGs, they really should not know anything specific about specific health information unless for some reason a complaint gets funneled up <coughs> on a person. And if it should and specifics are discussed, they need to be aware of the HIPAA violations that can take place. 
if they if they do that. But again, as part of these PPGs, somebody in the practice has to be obviously involved to help these work. And as that person from the practice facilitates these groups, they could lead them away from talking about you know, Edna's health condition to an 85-year-old woman's health condition, which is really how they need to discuss something if a complaint should come up. So it's de-identified? Yes. Yes. Okay. The purpose of this group is to provide feedback but not to influence practices. The practice of, or the primary care clinic is the one that ultimately decides if they want to influence these practices or not. However, something to consider, if you have a PPG and you don't do at least something that they have recommended, they're going to start feeling that they're pointless and that there's no reason for having them. So perhaps doing small things, if you can't do large things, is the best way to handle this. And again, the group must be multicultural and reflect demographics of practice and community. And this can help perhaps in the training aspect. If you have people from different parts of the demographic population that the clinic is serving, they might actually be able to give you good feedback on some of your training materials because they might know how to uh, reach those populations in the community better than you do. PPGs can sponsor health initiatives like health fairs, flu shots. They must remember that they do not represent only themselves. They represent the practice. So again, as a practice selects members for PPGs, they need to be careful that they select people who, rep who will represent them properly. And basically, they facilitate communication through technology and traditional means. A second idea is volunteer panels. And volunteer panels are people that agree to be surveyed by the practice to gauge their reaction to potential changes in the practice. Let's say the practice is going to change their hours and add Saturday hours. They would send a survey out to their volunteer panels who would be, uh, again, demographically distributed the way the population is and to see how they would feel about this. So volunteer panels are a way of pilot testing something before you actually do it to make sure it's something that your patient population as a whole wants. And then there's patient consortia. And this is a network of PPGs, patient forums, and focus groups. These are a larger population, so they can provide a broader view of patient health issues in the community. The problem is getting all these people together, but a consortium can be very effective. People in larger numbers can get out there to the community and to different organizations to get information to patients and to recruit patients for you. Ideas to increase. Uh, Patient engagement, again, is board of director appointments. Under uh, federally, FQHCs under, are required to have a board of director that's comprised of 51% consumers. But for other primary care clinics as a whole this might, who don't have to adhere to that, this may be something that they would also like to do. Again, uh, one patient representative would probably be significant. And again, the patient representative needs to be somebody who could help make board decisions and be representative of the practice. And they can also help with quality improvement. Committee appointments is another place. When you get into quality improvement committee appointments, however, you do have the consideration of HIPAA because everything would have to be uh, redacted so that no personal information could be seen for your quality improvement committee. That's not always the usual thing that's done, so it would take a lot more work to redact that to actually have patients on that committee. But a practice has to decide if it's worth it or not at that point. Challenges in providing patient engagement needs. Providers have not been taught the skills in the past. They need a broad skill set to deal with patient populations. They need to understand cultural factors, educational factors, mental health factors, disease factors, intelligence factors, all these different things. It's almost as if you have to take your patient and the history is no longer enough. You also need to address all of these very specific things in order to be able to train them to engage. 
Also, health literacy of patients is, again, a big problem. There is a lack of health literacy in the United States as a whole in a lot of, a lot of populations, and it's going to be harder to reach those populations. Well, let's talk about some obvious challenges. Time. There's already a shortage of physicians. How are physicians going to be able to do all this and see patients without waiting times and appointment times going through the roof? Well, right now, that's sort of unknown as to how providers are going to help all that make all that work. Resources are not unlimited. Practices have to work with what they have, and that can be very challenging. If a practice has to hire a marketing person and a quality improvement person and somebody to meet with the populace at large, that gets into a lot of cost for the practice. We're still dealing with a fragmented health system. And then sustainability. Once you engage with a patient, how do you sustain that over a long period of time, over years? The patient may drop off. The provider may drop off. It's very difficult to sustain long term. Challenges at this point. Right now, engagement does not necessarily mean better outcomes and reduce cost for health care overall. There Studies out there that show it's effective in small populations here and there, but globally it does not mean better outcomes. And the reason for this is patient choice. There's a model that's called the transtheoretical model of health behavior. And what this model basically says is patients have free will. And they're not going to change their health behaviors and stop eating Twinkies or uh, stop eating salt or whatever happens to exacerbate their medical problems, if they don't choose to do it, they're not going to do it. They have to be ready to change. And nobody can get them ready to change but themselves. So this is going to be something that's going to be very challenging to deal with. Also, this can conflict with evidence-based medicine because patients may want things that they really shouldn't have. Measuring patient engagement, uh, there's quantitative methods. Usually these will be some kind of internal survey. If you create your own internal survey, it should be standardized and it should be validated. So basically what you would do is if you decide to create your own, is you would create it and then you would give it to, uh, let's say, 30 patients across differing uh, demographics. Ask them to critique it, see if there's anything that they didn't understand. You go back and edit it, and you have a standardized and validated tool. There are also companies that do this. If you do your own internal survey, you can ask whatever you want to ask. But you're going to have to look and evaluate your data. If you use external surveys, they will do that for you. Some of them will let you ask the questions you want. Some of them are limited on that, and it all depends. But surveys should be analyzed by patient demographics. And you can look at gender, age, socioeconomic status, education level, ethnicity, reimbursement type. Um, data is used to resolve system issues, and system issues only, something that's going wrong across the board in many areas. They're not to be used for one poor outcome. If you have one poor outcome with a patient, these quantitative methods should not be used as a response to that. That will, that will actually be something different. You're going to fix that particular problem that caused that problem for that patient. These quantitative methods of measuring patient engagements are going to measure over the long term. The other way you can, yes? I'm sorry, this is Alicia. Um, what would be your suggested um, method in delivering uh, these surveys? Not everybody, um, like we're thinking, talking about community health centers, not everybody has um, access to the internet. So would you suggest a you know, written survey when they uh, check in for an appointment? or You could use it when they check in for an appointment. Um, you know, it depends how broad you want to go and how much you want to enroll patients. You could go to churches. You could go to the grocery store and, and set up a, a table, you know, to survey patients and get try to get them into your practice. I mean, it depends how far you want to go. It would definitely start with 
surveying the patients that you're seeing hmm. because the data you're going to get from them is where you are at PE right now. If you went out to the grocery store or the churches and did this as part of recruiting, you're just going to get data on people where people want to, you to be. So right. it's two differing things. And it depends which way you want to go. Okay. Um, the next one is qualitative methods. And we talked about these already. We have focus groups, PPGs and consortia, and interviews and open-ended questions. With these, you, my suggestion would be if you have a focus group or a PPG or a consortia, you actually take minutes. And you look, somebody needs to go back and look at these minutes to look to see if there's themes or problems that keep arising. That would be a qualitative analysis of your patient engagement. You're looking for similarities, you're looking for distances, and you're looking for themes of things that keep reoccurring. Because if it keeps reoccurring, that means you probably need to do something about it. Interviews can be used uh, with selected patients you would use open-ended questions. But again, if you use any qualitative method, you have to analyze it. There's no point in collecting data unless you analyze it. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Some considerations that you have to do as you're collecting your data, you need to consider the size of your patient population that's surveyed. You need to try to reduce bias. You don't want to put a question in there that Dr. J's medical practice is the best ever. You know, rate this as strongly agree, agree, disagree. That would be introducing bias. You want to make sure that your questions are written very objectively. Another problem is you need to be able to meet the needs of disabled patients in regards to gathering the data. So if you see deaf, pa deaf patients, you're going to have to uh, find some way to get that data to them. If you have blind patients, so you're looking at disabilities as well. Of course, if you have patients that are, are um, mentally challenged, you're not, probably not going to be able to survey them. But you will have to be able to meet the groups of the blind and the deaf and, and uh, so on. And you want to do this with random sampling. This is not something that you do constantly every day, 365 days a year. This is targeted. So what you do is you select a week or a month or whatever when you want to see how well your patients rate your, your engagement, the patients that are existing in your practice. You'll do this for a week, give the survey out to every patient, get it back and analyze the results. Or you'll talk to a few patients that week, write those results down, and analyze that. Data analysis is where people get really nervous. Um, it doesn't have to be complicated. But if you collect it, you have to do something with it. So basically, don't reinvent the wheel. If you use a Likert survey, and I don't know if you all know the terminology Likert survey, but let's say I do a survey and I give the patient can choose from strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree. That's a Likert scale survey. What I can do very easily is get all my um, surveys together, and I could calculate the percentages or the number of people that said strongly agree, strongly disagree. That's going to tell you something in and of itself. You don't have to do inferential statistics. You don't have to hire a statistician. If you're looking at that, at this percentages of patients that agree your clinic does good patient engagement would be sufficient. And you can get as complicated on the data analysis as you choose. If you choose to use a service, they're going to be able to do a more complicated data analysis for you, but they're going to they're going to charge you for it as well, and it's not it doesn't come cheap. Once you collect the data and you analyze it as part of the quality improvement process, you have to act on it. If there's something in there that comes to your attention that's important, then you need to act on it. Because if you do act on it, you can increase your patient satisfaction. You can potentially increase your patient adherence to their treatment, how the patients engage with you, your outcomes in theory, and you should be able to decrease utilization. And we expect all these wonderful things to happen if we engage with patients. But yet, I'm cautious about this. Uh, and I know that comes across because a lot of these things may or may not happen. Strategies to implement... Dr. Halupa, this is Dawn. Yes. 
Hi, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, I was curious in regards to um, utilizing your data and utilizing it to continue to improve as an organization and meet the needs of your patients. Can you talk about um, about that use from a public perception? Um, you know, how much data is too much? Should they be using it? Uh, you know, in their waiting rooms, in their annual reports, on their websites, sure. press releases, those kinds of things. Um, you know, how much is too much, but how little is too little? Um, uh, in regards to that, I mean, if, if you're doing quality improvement efforts, you're going to find things that you do good, and you're going to find things that you do bad. Obviously, you're not going to want to put up on your bulletin board the things you do bad, because that could open you up to potential litigation or, or any of a number of things. Um, if you do something very well, you're definitely going to want to put it up on your bulletin board in your office. You're going to want to post it on your website. You're going to want to do press releases because all these things will bring patients into you. And it shows that you're actually making an effort to improve. So if you do this qualitatively, you can, do, you can actually even post patient comments that, you know, Jane Q said blah, blah, blah. So you're going to pick and choose what you want to put up there. I would love to say that you, can, you need to put both good and bad because that's a balanced view, but that's just not reality because of all the factors that play into it with malpractice and litigation and all those other things. You have to be careful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, kind of a second question. Um, you know, Nevada is not unique, um, but yet it is uh, in, in many ways, too. Um, but all parts of the United States have both rural and frontier areas where there are primary care practices in some of those rural communities. And the challenge, there are many challenges and barriers for those patients and for those providers in those communities. And, and in Nevada's um, example, there are um, quite a few clinics that aren't open even Monday through Friday, um, you know, 8 to 5. Um, it's a less frequent schedule than that. Can you talk a little bit about engagement and satisfaction when you have very limited um, hours of operation and um, some of the other challenges or barriers that happen in the very rural and frontier um, parts of um, our, our country? Um, if you look at rural residents as a whole, they have poorer patient outcomes. They have um, they're more likely to die uh, if they have a heart attack. Rural populations as a whole are not as good as most urban populations, particularly suburban populations in the United States. It becomes very difficult when clinics are only open one or two days a week. When um, I was in Nebraska and I used to go to a clinic that they had that was only open one or two days a week. As you're trying to foster patient engagement, even though you're not open, there's other ways that perhaps you can engage, and that would be telephone. Uh, the, if, if the providers are willing to you know, take messages and get back to the patient, you can engage via, uh, if you have a secure system, you might be able to do it via webcam or other ways to actually engage with your patients. A lot of patients like to email. Email is another one, but again, you have to be careful that nothing that could be considered a HIPAA violation is covered in email because, again, email can be hacked as well. So those are some technologies that you can use. However, the problem is in rural areas tends to have a lot of older residents. So those older residents are probably not going to engage with those technologies. So um, perhaps have alternatives for them. If your practice is not open those days, if you have a, a nurse line that could help them, that might be helpful for the patients that don't engage in technology. OK? Did I answer your question good enough? Yes, you did. That was very helpful. Thank you. OK. The next thing I'm going to talk about is strategies to implement patient engagement. Before you even start, you have to have a, a clear framework and plan. You have to look at your organization, you have to look at what your goal is, and you look, have to look at incremental pieces how you choose to get there. You have to consider your resources, you have to consider if you can hire people to help you with this, if you want to use outside sources for surveys or other things with patients. 
So that is going to be a large undertaking that needs to be very complete and you need to look at all aspects. The next step is you want to get training and information out. You have to train your providers and you need to train your patients as well. And then you have to teach your patients and implement a self-management strategy for the practice. How are you going to manage these patients when you can't see them because you already have too many other patients? Are you going to use email? Are you going to use technology? Are you going to use mid-level providers, RNs? Whatever you have to do to make this work, you, all those decisions have to be made before you can actually do this. The next strategy uh, you need to consider the health literacy for your patients. You can't make people literate, but it may go as far as if you have a population of illiterate persons that you might almost have to do cartoons for certain things or which are, are available, and you might need to use those because they can't read. And then there has to, you should have a public venue, which we already did talk about, where patients can see the quality improvement initiatives and the results. So patients want to see that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. Transparency is critical. If you're not transparent as a provider, they're going to go to somebody who will be as soon as this patient engagement takes off and more patients are aware of it. Um, existing PE instruments, uh, proprietary ones, Gallup does one, Patient Engagement Systems does one, and Press Ganey does one for satisfaction. Press Ganey is the most widely used in hospitals, but there are much more pri proprietary instruments out there. But again, they're all very costly, but I thought I would just mention them. Non-proprietary measures, ones that are already created that you can use, the patient activation measure, the CAP survey, which we talked about earlier, and the non-proprietary patient-centeredness actually survey. And this evaluates the patient perception of patient-centeredness. How involved was the patient? Did the care revolve around the patient? And it also looks at consultation care, not just the primary care as a whole. Now, the PPPC was actually developed in Canada. And this was a 14-item scale, uses Likert scale again. And it has a significant correlation for alleviation of patient concerns and better emotional health two months after the initial visit. And the patients that were surveyed with this instrument tend to have uh, fewer referrals and fewer care episodes later on. <coughs> and then the CCM is actually from Great Britain. And this has five subscales that it talks about communication and partnership, personal relationship, health promotion, positive and clear approach to problems, and interest in the effect on life. And this is how patients can be assessed as to what some of their needs are and how they want them to be met. Some more existing non-proprietary instruments. Um, I'm, I just listed these on the next slide, this slide and the next slide, just to give you an idea that there's quite a few out there. I'm not going to name them all. Um, you can read them and see them. And there are quite a few of them. There's one specifically at the very end. The care is for patient communication skills with the doctor specifically. Now becomes the next challenge is that I talked about earlier is not all patients want to be engaged. Al Lewis, who happens to be a health blogger, noted on his website that he chooses not to be engaged for various reasons. He had People don't want to be engaged because they had a bad experience, their fear of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And some people don't want to be engaged because they fear that they're going to have to require a procedure they can't afford. Also, some people treated this patient engagement as the flavor of the month. They've been through HMOs. They've been through disease management. They've been through wellness. And now we've gone to patient engagement. To them, it's just the same thing with another name. And some people may be burned out on the different changes and what it's called, because to them, it's not being met in many cases. 
for some patients, oops, sorry about that. For some patients, patient engagement is not desired. It's not possible. If you have a person that lives very remotely out in the middle of nowhere and doesn't have internet, doesn't have a telephone, you're obviously not going to engage them. And in some patients, engagement actually decreases satisfaction because they plain just want you to leave them alone. One study that was done by Aurora and McCorney found that 69% of patients preferred to leave medical decisions to their provider. The older a patient was, the more likely they did not want to engage. The more education a patient had, the more engaged the patient wished to be. And women were more likely to be engaged than men. And this was of a population of 2,196 patients. And all the patients in this study had diabetes, depression, MI, congestive heart failure, and hypertension. So this shows that patient engagement can work. And this is an old study back from 2000. Tuning et al. did a meta-analysis on 115 studies of patient preferences for involvement of health decisions. So basically, they looked at every research article from 1980 to 2007. And what they found is that in 63% of the studies, the majority of the participants wanted to be engaged at some level and share decisions. The challenge is everybody is an individual and may want to be engaged at a different level. Also, from 2000 to 2007, more people wanted to share decisions. So it went up from 63% as the whole population, but between 2000 and 2007, it went up to 71% meaning more patients wanted to be engaged. Some more strategies to implement patient engagement. Communication platforms, and we've talked about these quite a bit. Patient portals, um, websites, call lines. There's all different ways that you can do this. Having universal access to patient records. If you put patient information online, again, it has to be put in such a manner that the patient can actually understand it. The way we usually do medical records is not a way that a patient's going to understand it. It almost has to be translated if it's going to be put on this form. You need to develop approaches to measure patient engagement, satisfaction, and quality because all three of them play in together. And they all are part of how a patient's going to want to come to your practice, how a patient's going to want to stay in your practice. One concept I'm just going to talk about briefly that I'm sure you know some about is the patient-centered medical home. And with the patient-centered medical home, the electronic health record's an integral part for this to work. And Bates and Bitten studied four small practices, and they actually found a 20% savings when they did this in their particular population. But the requirements of the technology, uh, the portion of the Reinvestment Act of 2009 says that the electronic records must have meaningful use. Meaningful use means that the patients can actually understand it. And you're supposed to target key domains central to the medical home, such as coordinating care, engaging patients and families, improving population management. The problem right now with this is that the electronic medical records don't have a lot of the functionality that they need to be able to do this very easily. And if they do, they are very, very, very expensive. And every practice is different, so a practice is going to have to figure out what's going to meet their needs best. Some more strategies is the group medical home concept. This was a Seattle-based group practice that did a two-year pilot study on where several medical groups got together and formed a medical group home, and they yielded 29% fewer emergency visits, 6% fewer hospitalizations, and they had a savings of $10 per month, per patient per month, 21 months into the pilot. So this is not something that happens overnight, and that's why I selected this study. This is something that's not going to happen even in six months. It's going to be a long-term project in order to get patients to engage and actually stay with your practice and become engaged in their care to improve their outcomes. So what does this mean to physicians? It means physicians are going to have new, role, new roles. 
rather than seeing uh, as many patients as they saw before, they're only going to see maybe eight to ten patients per day. They need to have quality time to communicate with that patient. Patient education is going to have to go on. It doesn't necessarily have to be the provider that does that. But again, we have a shortage of providers, so how are we ever going to manage this? Providers also need time for specific care planning for their patients, and this can take quite a bit of time. Again, care planning can be designated uh, as done by an RN, but there would be some physician involvement as well. The other thing that's predicted is physicians are going to spend the rest of their time communicating with patients via portals, email, and with staff. So they're going to go much more electronic, but again, the problem with that is going to be that not everybody uses technology. Uh, Kilo in 2005 in the Green Health Project suspects that about 80% of physician time is going to be spent on the phone and 20% of the time in visits. In other words, we're going to transform. Instead of having patients come in, we're going to do more diagnosis over the phone, which can be good and bad. Uh, some things can't be diagnosed over the phone and would require visits. Some things like a cold can. The problem with all this, with these new physician roles that are being predicted, is the payment structure. The payment structure right now is you get reimbursed per patient visit. You don't get reimbursed for the time you spend care planning necessarily. You don't get reimbursed for the time you communicate with them on email and on portals. And until that happens, this is not going to be an easy transformation for physicians because they won't be able to afford to do it. There's only 24 hours in a day. Other technologies that are available to facilitate patient engagement, uh, use of personal monitoring devices on your patients, informational websites. You can refer your patients to diagnostic websites like Dr. Google, uh, Dr. Google and triagehealth.com, but again, your patients have to have literacy and they have to have technology to use these things. Other technologies available to facilitate patient engagement, we already talked about electronic medical records. Do you or not allow a patient view? But electronic medical records are not a magic pill for patient engagement. Just because a patient can see something doesn't mean that they're engaged. There has to be teamwork. There has to be ease of use. In addition to the patient being able to view what's there, there has to be interaction in order for engagement to occur. Other issues are patient literacy um, and can they interpret the results. Even if you put them in a simplistic way, can they interpret results? And results without interpretation or context don't really tell the patients anything. In fact, it can scare them and make them think they have something that they don't actually have. So it, you have to be careful with this as well. By 2008, only 64% of physicians had ever even used an electronic medical record. Rural uh, health providers are willing to use such records, but they don't necessarily have the money in their practices to do so. And oddly enough, female physicians were significantly less willing to use these tools than their male peers. So for some reason, physicians, uh, female physicians don't necessarily like electronic medical records in a study that was done in 2011. I think when you look at that, you have to look at the concerns of patient privacy, the accuracy of the data, the potential liability for tracking the information that can be entered into a personal health record, and again, the lack of payment for the clinicians who are using or reviewing these health, work, these, uh, health records are all big concerns. A second technology available is patient portals. And with patient portals, these are basically moved beyond a patient electronic medical record to something that a patient can actually interact with. And with this particular study that was done in 2011, they took 41 primary care practices in the Midwest, and they assessed familial risk for their patients for diseases and provided specific risk-tailored health messages to these people. So if I had... Um, High, high cholesterol, I would get a message every day reminding me that I should eat this or eat that or not eat this or not that. And they, indic they did this continually. Uh, patients received an age and sex-specific health message, and they measured them at uh, baseline and six months afterward. 
about 3,300 people com completed the study. And, but the only problem with this study is the participants were primarily white, primarily female, and primarily insured. And you're going to see a lot different interaction in patient portals with those people who don't necessarily meet those criteria. But they felt like these messages actually decreased some of their patients' risk by using this. Some other technologies that are available, open notes. Patients can see provider notes from their visit. There is a study done at three hospitals with 105 primary care physicians. They used Beth Israel in Boston, Geisinger in Pennsylvania, which is right by where I grew up, and it's a very rural hospital in a very rural area, and Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. And they looked at about 13,500 patients. Looking at these patients, about 84% opened one note in Boston, 92% of them opened it at Geisinger, and 47% in Seattle. So actually in this study, the rural residents were more likely to actually look at their visit notes than perhaps the urban residents, which is interesting because we always think of rural residents as not having as good of technology. You know, for example, I live very rural. I don't have high-speed internet. I have satellite. So there's all types of different uh, barriers in the rural community. We already talked with Healthware about patient portals to a certain degree, and patient portals can um, basically be an interactive health record if you want it to be, or it cannot be. It can just be one way and provide data. And the next thing is social media. And there's been quite a few studies out there looking at social media. Um, with social media, you have to be really cautious because with social media, you can't make sure, you have to make sure that you don't put anything that's going to violate HIPAA out there. Um, a study in 12 Western European countries in 2008 to 2009 looked at about 873 hospitals. And they used social media to engage with patients, but what they basically used it for was a marketing tool. This is the way they got patients into their practices and staying with their practices by using social media. It was not something that was actually used to truly enhance patient engagement. Discussion forums are another uh, way that you can engage patients by having your own clinic discussion form. Again, you need to be careful because people can put things on there that you don't really want on there. So anything with the social media, you have to be very, very cautious of. Even though there's several studies that say it can be used, there's a lot of detriments to it. Other technologies that are available are email, instant messaging, and video chat. In some practices, patients pay a fee for this so they can communicate freely. There's a physician in Dallas that if you pay him $5,000 a year, he will be at your beck and call 24 hours a day. He will do a full body MRI. He will do all the possible lab work on you that's possible. And you pay him $5,000 a year to self-insure, and you get what you want, when you want, how you want it. But he's concierge medicine, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit because we're seeing an upsurge in concierge medicine as well. With these different factors of communicating with the patients with these technologies, you still need to be able to provide an appointment if a patient needs it within 24 hours if it's a condition that is warrants being seen that quickly. Challenges with technology, not all patients use it, especially the elderly and the low income. Privacy concerns, which we've talked about several places throughout. Additional provider and staff burden. Somebody has got to man that and answer patient questions, um, answer emails, and technology is expensive. So those are all considerations if a practice decides to implement it. The last thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is marketing and market share. And practices that want to increase their market share in relation to patient engagement need to do the regular marketing things that you have to do no matter what your business is. You need to develop a brand identity. You have to uh, develop a community image. And one suggestion that came out of Howley in 2007 is you employ your own specialty physicians. The reason for this is if you're looking at marketing and patient engagement, even if your patients are happy with you, if you refer them to a physician that they're not happy with, it's going to reflect back on you. So that's why that's one of the suggestions for medical practices. 
Practices which want to increase market share can increase group size. This is if they can find additional physicians, because that's troublesome in a lot of areas, rural areas, for example. Increase the number of mid-level providers. Offer concierge medical services. In other words, if a lot of practices may not be able to do this, but some practices may be able to offer concierge medical services as their payment structures are not responding on the federal and state program side. This is an alternative that you can take to generate revenue from people who are willing to pay. And then you can also in, increase the number of assistive personnel you use to engage patients. You don't have to have somebody trained to engage patients. Uh, in other words, if you have somebody that you want to send a health email out to this population, a secretary or an assistant can do that. So our, those are some ways of dispersing the workload. Collaborative partnerships with industry. Um, if you are in an area where you have a, a plant or some other manufacturing or some other kind of organization that has to do occupational health physicals or especially in today's market, if you have an industry that no longer wants to pay health insurance premiums and wants to self-insure their population, these collaborative partnerships are open for practices that seek to get them. Again, in order, if you go out and seek a collaborative partnership and you agree to take on 1,000 patients, then you need to have the provider load and assistive load in order to be able to do that. Another way is to establish partnerships with hospitals. Basically, you feed them and they feed you. It's a, a commensal relationship. And then again, to seek occupational health contracts. There's also employers out there that need um, drug screening done uh, for employment and all these different things. And those are all ways that you can increase your market share. You can engage with patients if they have a pleasant experience with you when they come in for an occupational health urine. They may, in fact, come back to your practice because they liked it. As reimbursement becomes tied to patient outcomes, it's almost going to be to the point, if everything goes the way it's predicted, that practices may have to hire marketing staff. There's going to be data mining involved. There's going to be marketing practices involved. It actually is an art and a science on how to market properly. So although especially small practices never had marketing people before, this is something that needs to be considered as patient engagement becomes more prevalent. Um, create online co uh, communities is another way to try to gain patients. Man call centers, organize media campaigns. These are all sort of traditional marketing things that can be done. Your marketing staff, if you have to hire one, they can incorporate your clinical data into outreach. They can customize the online experience using clinical data, like sending out the emails I spoke about later. They can focus on the online forums, on key patient segments, and create those for you. They can evaluate community data. They can help even evaluate some of your quality improvement data. And they serve as a communication touch point. It's a person in your practice that the patients can call and talk to about most anything, even if it's not related to their specific condition, but they want to engage with the medical clinic just to tell somebody that they're doing better or whatever it happens to be. So using patient engagement to meet marketing and practice challenges, basically everything old is new again. The pendulum swinging from volume to relationships. Practices are going to have to be available when the patients are, and that includes after hours on Saturdays and Sundays, and we talked about all the challenges about that already. In marketing, location, 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 location is everything, and that's an important consideration. And getting a good location and getting a fancy office costs a lot of money, and that may not be something that a provider, for example, in a rural area can afford. <coughs> Retail strategies, basically, primary care clinics and groups are going to be treated almost as if they were any other kind of business. They're going to advertise their strengths. They're going to try to get more patients in if they want to increase their patient engagement. Some PE data in marketing that could be looked at if you're going to measure patient engagement in marketing, the average time spent with patients, 
patient satisfaction, additional services the patient may want you to offer, and then loyalty ratings. How likely is a patient to stay with your clinic? So basically, in conclusion, patient engagement is multifactorial. It's both physicians and patients working together. It's being regulated. It's expected by most patients. It has to be evaluated holistically. You can't just evaluate one tiny piece of it. Patient engagement encompasses a whole lot of different factors. It requires evaluation of the population that you're serving. You need to look at demographics of that population to know how to do your training materials, to do your informational materials, to try to reach them. It requires data collection and data analysis. It can be facilitated by technology, but technology is not the only answer. Patient engagement will be used in marketing in the future. We talked earlier with a question about press releases and posting your quality improvement data and your patient engagement data online. It's going to be hard to maintain with decreased reimbursement. Even if it exists, doesn't necessarily mean that patient out engagement is going to lead to better patient outcomes. It's going to require practices to interact more than they ever have before, and they're going to require designated personnel. And these are just some of the brief takeaways about patient engagement in all that I've talked about for the last hour or however long it's been. Um, these are the major points that I just wanted to put in conclusion for all of you. And I always like to end with a quote. Everybody thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. And when I saw this quote, I linked this specifically right to patients themselves. Patients want the providers sometimes to change them, to change their health, but they have to change it themselves. A provider can't do it all by themselves. The patient has to engage and be ready to change as well. Well, thank you, and that's all I had, unless there's any other questions. I do have a list of references on here that uh, for all the different studies and all that I looked at in preparation of this. And I guess I will turn it over to you, Scott. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Halupa, for a, a lively and informative presentation regarding patient engagement. Uh, we also wanted to thank all participants for their questions and comments. At this point, the webinar is ending. For future trainings and events, please visit our website or contact Scott Campbell at 775-887-0417. Thank you to all for attending. The webinar is now over.